Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm BK from the Pennsylvania Park Maintenance Institute. Uh, just as a little background, one of our strategic goals is investigating efficient and sustainable maintenance operations for the benefit of all citizens within our communities. Uh, as municipalities address aging infrastructure and public services, it's prudent for us to consider more environmentally friendly alternatives to more traditional approaches that we've used. So in this edition of Shop Talk, we've invited Lori Yike, who is uh, from the Pennsylvania Department of Recreation and Conservation. Uh, she's a recreation and conservation manager, and she's gonna share her insights today uh, from the green infrastructure projects. And this session, is designed to explore how incorporating green infrastructure into parks and trails and other public amenities creates a variety of user experiences and reduces flooding and improves water quality and sediment pollution. Uh, Lori has helped me to invite two other experts today uh, and they're gonna share some of their experiences as case studies for implementation. Uh, we have Chalet Harris, who is the Recreation Director of Dover Township here in Pennsylvania, and also Kate King, who is the Executive Director of Spring Grove Regional Parks and Recreation Center. Uh, Chalet and Kate will share their experiences working within municipality-owned park systems that utilize a variety of grant programs to leverage significant funding for large park rehabilitation and water quality improvement projects. So our purpose of this session today is to highlight how communities can approach federal and state clean water requirements as an avenue to diversify recreational amenities in our parks and offer a variety of activities to enhance visitor experiences, but also support our efforts towards becoming more climate resilient. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Lori. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction to myself and my uh, cohorts here, Kate King and Shelley Harris. I'm gonna uh, move on to review the agenda today. Um, Brian BK already did the introductions of the speakers. Uh, then uh, I'm gonna talk about the stick of stormwater regulations and the carrot of the multi-benefits of incorporating green infrastructure into parks, trails, and waterways. And then we really wanna focus on the real things, what's happening out in the real world with some recreation case studies in Jackson Township and Dover Township. And then we'll end with uh, a summary and questions and answers. To keep things moving along, we would greatly appreciate it if during the presentation, uh, you would hold your questions to the end or you can, go in the chat box and Brian can assist you uh, as well. Uh, and we will try to answer them as best we can in the time that we have. Just a heads up, this information is really rich and uh, Kate and Chalet have great things to share. So we might most likely will go over the one hour to probably about 1.15, uh, 1.30. Uh, we will try to wrap it up as soon as we can, you know, around the one o'clock time. But if you need to leave the session, we completely understand. Just a heads up. Okay. So I wanted to just uh, start with talking about what are some of the challenges in communities right now? What's happening? And there are numerous things. When we think about today's communities, they're struggling with aging infrastructure, they're struggling with the impacts and effects of climate change. This picture over here on the right uh, is taken in, in a place where I live, which is Middletown, and they smashed their record of their flood. Uh, it crested at 16 feet, devastating flood. And in Hershey, it received more than 12 inches, Middletown 13 inches, Mechanicsburg 10 inches. Elizabethtown a whopping 15 inches of rain within a short period of time with $150 million damage to those communities. So that was a flooding event that I think it was Ivanhoe that, that flood Ivan that happened about four years ago. So climate change is impacting us in numerous ways. And what's happening is 
it's stressing the aging infrastructure that we have in these communities. And also on top of that, you have federal and state mandates that are requiring communities to manage their stormwater in a, in a way that reduces pollution and flooding. So you have kind of a, a worst case scenario that's happening right now. And it's a real struggle. So how do we meet those struggles? What, what's happening? Why are we doing what's happening? So I am in no way, I'm going to preface this by saying I am not an engineer. I am not an expert on the water regulations. I get assistance from engineers and consultants that I work with. So I'm going to try to explain it the best way I can. There are various federal and state permit-based regulations that are aimed at protecting the health of our waterways. I know there might be some people outside of Pennsylvania that are on the call and that's fantastic, but I'm gonna talk about in Pennsylvania because that's more what I'm familiar with, obviously. In P Pennsylvania, the Munic Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems are, or MS4, are a, defined as a system of conveyance, including but not, but not limited, to streets, ditches, and pipes that is owned by a municipality or another public body created under state law having jurisdiction over disposal of sewage, industrial waste, stormwater, and other waste designed or used for collecting or conveying stormwater. Municipalities and other entities such as universities and prisons that meet certain standards must obtain permits to adhere to state and federal regulations pertaining to the discharges of stormwater from their municipal sewer systems. Stormwater regulations are associated with the Federal Clean Water Act, are administered under the MS4 program by the Environmental Protection Agency or EPA. In Pennsylvania, the MS4 program is managed by the DEP or Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. The purpose of these regulations is to reduce the levels of pollutants nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, and also the volume of storm, storm water that occurs during local waterway events and so certain rain events that flows the water into our waterways. So several years ago, I read an article about all these requirements that are and mandates that are coming down to communities Based, a lot of them based on Chesapeake Bay regulations, but all these things happening. And I started to think about, okay, okay, this is, this is the stick. This is, this is the stick. And it may seem really horrible to these communities and I don't manage budgets of any municipalities, but how in the world are these communities going to meet these mandates with their limited resources? So that's the stick. However, when you think about stormwater, there are two options. There's green infrastructure and there's gray infrastructure. Green infrastructure is a cost-effective, resilient approach to managing wet weather that impacts, that provides many community benefits. While gray infrastructure is a conventional way of removing water from an area through through piped and drainage, water treatment systems that are designed to move urban stormwater away from the built environment. Green infrastructure reduces and treats stormwater at its source while delivering many environmental, social, and economic benefits. Let's delve in this a little more. So the EPA defines green infrastructure as a cost-effective environmental-friendly approach to stormwater and other excess flows entering combined or separate sewer systems. Green infrastructure approaches, use, approaches in a manner that's natural, that mimics natural systems such as forests areas, engineered systems such as rain gardens to cleanse water and reduce excess volumes by filtering and treating it using plant soils and microbes. Green infrastructure can be used to reduce our reliance on pipes, channels, and expensive engineered treatment systems that are costly to build, operate, and maintain. So when we think of infrastructure in our communities, there are various types, right? Let's think about it. You have industry, businesses, homes, streets, alleys, schools, 
and parks. All of these entities have some type of impervious surface where they have to work with local mandates to regulate how their water flows from impervious surfaces into waterways. How can they reduce that? How can they comply with all of these regulations? In order to comply with them, some communities have figured out that gray infrastructure is much more costly and offers not as many benefits as green infrastructure. And that's why parks are so valuable to communities in a, in a way now that we need to think of parks not only as a nice thing to say, not only as a necessity, but a nice thing to say, but also a, a necessity to our community's health. So you think of the, the regulations are the stick, but the carrot is our parks. And let's delve into this some more. I fully admit that I have stolen this picture, borrowed this picture in air quotes from uh, land studies. And I'm going to go into it now. I just think it's so great. I have to always feature it. When you think of parks and, and gray infrastructure, and you think of a single function of, we look at the, the picture on the left and the old phones. Those of you who are over the age of 40 understand what this phone used to look like. They, you used to have to dial it up and it had a single function to call your gas company or to call your friends. That's all it did, it didn't do anything. So when we look down here on this park on the left, that's all this channel and pipe is doing. It's conveying the water from the parking lot, the storm water, down through a system of pipes to somewhere else. Now let's think about our cell phones. Oh my goodness, everything that we can do on that cell phone, it's multiple functions that allows us to do so many things. And if we think of green, implementing green infrastructure into parks, we can provide by implementing green infrastructure in our parks, we can offer a variety of experiences for users to choose from. So in this case, we have a wetland, but next to this wetland might be a basketball court or might be a tennis court or might be, there could be a trail around it. And therefore the park, it's slowing, in that case, they're taking their stormwater and putting it there and cleaning it up and slowing the flow before it goes outside so it slows down and does not pollute our waterways. So now I'm going to talk about some other, uh, some types of green infrastructure that we commonly see in parks, trails, and waterways. We have a rain garden here. Again, it's collecting water, slowing it down, and using some plants and some special soils to do that. Over here, we have a pervious basketball court. And I'm gonna spend a little time on the next slide about that. And here we have a, 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 we have a swale and we have, we're not mowing, we're enhancing this riparian area. And by not having to mow down here, we're also saving some money. And we're creating an opportunity for people to explore the environment in a way that they might not have if this had all been mowed. And it's offering opportunities for wildlife habitat Talk about pervious pavement here. In parks, there's, in other places, there's great opportunities in, in parking lots to put in some green infrastructure. You can have, here we have the tree swales, we have uh, pervious pavement, and you can see that the water is draining down through the pervious pavement, flowing through, and underneath it's capturing it and holding it. And sometimes I've seen parks where they actually have a tank underneath the parking lot and then they hold that water and they use it to ir irrigate their baseball field. That occurs in Lebanon County's Coleman Park. Here at the basketball court, I've heard from folks in Lancaster, the city of Lancaster that they're able to use their courts more because the water drains through and there's not puddling. Also, it melts in the snow and it's also quieter. So there's some additional benefits. Here are some additional uh, green infrastructure elements. We have a naturalized infiltration basin. You can see that here. Uh, and here we have a 
a wetland riparian buffer, and you can see how everything is becoming de-channelized. And, and both the case studies will talk about that more in depth. And you have different types of plants in the riparian buffer, different zones. Again, we're mimicking nature. Nature knows best. Here we have a vegetated roof on, at a nature center. Uh, we have some warm season meadows and we have runoff and capture reuse with this rain barrel. Again, we can use the captured, I do this at my house. I capture rain from our uh, roof and water my plants. So another carrot that's associated with green infrastructure and is just amazing and something that we're really seeing a lot projects lately is that when you have a project that includes both recreation elements and green infrastructure or, or prop or components that are designed to address stormwater management, that also means it opens you up to different funding sources that can leverage ours. We see this over and over again. And this means that there is a less of a burden on our local community if they can leverage our funding with other funding because the majority of our grants require a 50% match. So we have been trying our best to honor this request and look at projects holistically so that they not only meet the recreation needs of a community, but also the conservation and water quality improvement goals and mandates of that, that that community has. So here are several different types of funding sources that are used in projects and, and Chalet and Kate are gonna talk about this later. One thing that's very important that we're seeing more and more, and I mentioned this earlier, is that communities are becoming stressed also because of the impacts of climate change. And what's happening is we're seeing that green infrastructure can help communities become more climate resilient. And in this graphic from EPA, we can see that how parks play a very important role in helping communities become more climate resilient. They help with flooding, drought. Think of how hot our summers have been. I mean, last week in November, we were doing yard work in our short sleeves, in short sleeves. And coastal damage with the erosion of the sand dunes and how, and again, how hot and planting trees and rain gardens and putting more green in your community reduces that heat, collects water, um, mit mitigates flooding. So there's all also these things use less energy if we have trees next to our houses and our businesses. So there's all sorts of multiple benefits and carrots that are happening. So I just wanna summarize here and talk about this. The carrots of integrating green infrastructure are the following. They mitigate the effects of climate change. They create resilient communities. They improve water quality, address regulatory requirements. They reduce flooding. Uh, Chalet has a great story about that in her case study. And they provide the opportunity for leveraging multiple funding sources, which address the the challenge that many communities have with doing large capital projects for their parks and also the costs associated with meeting these pollution reduction goals. Now I'm gonna turn the program over to uh, Kate King and Chalet, and we're gonna talk about two case studies in York County, Pennsylvania. We put up this map so you could get an idea of where these projects are located at. So, uh, Kate? All right, thank you, Lori. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, I'm Kate King. I'm with the Springer of Regional Parks and Recreation Center um, in York County, and I am going to highlight uh, Little Creek Community Park today in Jackson Township. Uh, so um, our organization, to give you a little bit of a background because I'm set up a little bit differently, I'm a regional uh, park and rec um, organization. So we've been around about 15 plus years. Um, I have three municipalities. So I have Spring Grove Borough, Jackson Township, Paradise Township, and we also have the school district as one of our partners. Um, we're one of two established regional recreation groups in York County. 
Um, currently, we have three local parks. They've all been DCR, DCNR funded. Um, Jackson Township is our fourth park and the largest that we have, again, DCR fun DCNR funded. Um, and we have been awarded um, DCNR grant funding six times. So we're very um, proud of that and um, very hopeful for future funding as well. Um, some of the programs that we do, we have child care programs, summer camps, uh, fitness centers, senior activities, community classes, seminars, workshops. Um, I like to tell people we're set up kind of like a mini, mini YMCA, so we do similar things like that. Special events, um, rental opportunities, all of our parks have pavilions that we rent out, um, mostly in the summertime. Um, some people nowadays um, are wanting to be outside even more, so we're renting them um, almost year-round. Um, we're also um, partners with the Chamber of, local Chamber of Commerce, obviously PRPS, the Friends of Kedora State Park. We work very closely with the state park that's in, right in our backyard, which is a, a wonderful partnership. Um, we also have a York Area Rec Director group that we're a part of, and uh, the York County Rail Trail Authority, we are a member of that as well. So giving a little black background on the um, site and location, this picture is our master plan. Um, we are in phase two of this project, so it doesn't look like this yet, um, but we're getting there. Some of the pieces are in. Um, so this is a former golf course, 18-hole um, golf course. Um, sits kind of in the heart of the residential area in Jackson Township. Um, the township bought it in 2014, and the uh, plan was to convert it into a community park. Um, it's a total of 41 acres, the entire property. What you're seeing here on the picture is about approximately 18 acres is the front nine of the golf course. The back part of the golf course, another nine holes, is actually still operating as a golf course. So it's a very unique opportunity to have um, multiple uh, functions and recreational opportunities on one location. Um, so we are running half of it as a golf course. Um, we are in phase two, as I mentioned before. Um, phase one has been completed. Um, and Little Creek, um, and you can see here on the picture there, a uh, picture of the creek, uh, it contributes to the west branch of the Cadoras Creek and flows um, straight through this park. Uh, and I'll get a little, I'll get more into that a little bit um, as we go here on, on our stream project. Uh, how this all came about as well is there was a joint comprehensive plan that was done in 2006 between Jackson Township and Paradise Township. And from that study, um, there was an area uh, set forth that would be or um, recommended to be a regional area, a regional park. And um, this location, uh, when it came for sale, was actually almost exactly where this comprehensive plan had called for, a regional park. So, of course, the township jumped on the opportunity. And from there, um, we created some uh, study groups, engaged the public, engaged some community leaders, engaged other uh, rec professionals, and kind of found out what the needs and wants were. Um, of our local community and our surrounding community since this was a regional park um, and what people wanted to see, um, what support did we have and what funding was available. So that's kind of how this project and this master plan um, came to fruition. So our um, funding, as Lori mentioned, um, a project like this and being on a regional level, there's lots of opportunities for um, funding partnerships. Um, we did get, because of the stream, we were able to get Growing Greener money through DEP for $53,000. That helped with the permitting and design for the stream restoration that flows through the park. Um, the township also contributed uh, $450,000, which is the matching funds that we received from DCNR. And you see there we got $200,000 for phase one and two hundred fifty dollars for phase two. So those are the matching funds that um, the township would have to put forth. Um, one of our sports groups also donated $5,000 towards this project because um, we are able to provide some fields within this park. PH Gladfelder is one of the biggest, biggest biz, local businesses in our area. They contributed $15,000, so we were able to uh, build a pavilion, which you'll see in some pictures um, in the next few slides. Uh, DCED CFA money um, is pending at the moment. Um, we have an application in. Everything's kind of been delayed due to COVID, um, but we hope to get that funding and be able to add a few more things to the park um, before we uh, go into phase three. Um, Church and Dwight is the biggest um, business within Jackson Township, and they contribute $11,000 towards um, the landscaping of the park. So trees, flowers, plants, um, anything uh, that was 
um, green or, or pertain to landscaping um, was their preference. Um, so that's what that money went towards. And then the storm, York County Stormwater Consortium um, gave us 98,000, again, for the stream restoration. Um, that was what those funds were for. So you can see there, there's quite a few and there's many more out there, but for this project in particular, we have you know, um, well over half a dozen different ways that we were able to get funding and, and partnerships um, for this project. So this is Little Creek before. So this is the golf course and what it looked like when the property was built uh, or bought, excuse me. Um, you can see part of the stream there and it, it looks pretty rough. Um, and that was the bridges that they had in for you to cross the stream. And this is kind of um, from the corner looking out towards the road and the building you see in the back, there's the clubhouse. So this is kind of a before picture. And then as you'll see here, um, we'll have some after pictures. So yay, after pictures. This is phase one um, of our park, a few, um, few of the amenities. So you see the pavilion here and next to our clubhouse. Um, this is a huge rain garden that was put in. There's actually two within the park. Um, uh, interesting here, we had the high school come in. Um, they have a gardening club and they came in and planted. Um, there's about uh, 2,000 plants in there that they came in and planted for us over the summer. Um, and then came back and weeded it later. So it was an opportunity for them to uh, engage in the community and their local parks and also learn a, a little bit about what plants go into a rain garden and how a rain garden functions. So that was a unique opportunity that we got to take advantage of. And then the bottom picture here is kind of looking back out at the park as well. Sorry, Laurie. <laughs> um, I, I kept talking. <laughs> um, and you can kind of see the walking path that was created along with our tot lot. And then this is the tot lot we put in. This is a two to five play structure. Um, the um, uh, DCD money that we're waiting on um, is hopefully going to be um, for a five to 12 play structure. You'll find if you are building parks that it's nice to have the five to 12 and the two to five um, because families have such a, you know, array of kids. And a lot of times these little uh, parks and these little playgrounds don't do it for the, the older kids. Um, so that's what that money that was pending we're waiting for, we're hoping to add that. Um, below you also see uh, one of the new bridges, there's two. Um, this one looks way better than the before picture that you saw. Um, you can also see some of the stream restoration and there's a, a picture we'll see here coming up, um, but you can kind of see how it looks and, uh, much better, um, much more clean and much more safe as well. And then this is the stream restoration project. Um, so uh, this was done by, the stream restoration project was done by land studies. Um, the, this is how the project kind of all started was because of the stream. Um, we were having some flow issues. If you look in here at this picture in 2018, you can obviously see nothing was really flowing appropriately. Um, water quality was horrible. Um, and so that's how this kind of all started because of the issues we were having um, with water flow. And then of course the MS4 requirements um, for our township, um, doing this stream restoration along with the park met all the requirements that were necessary for our township. Um, so that's part of the reason that this whole, pro our whole project started. Um, so then if you look at the after picture here um, in the spring of 2019, um, that's what it actually looked like after they finished. I get a lot of questions, especially right when it was done. Does that look right? Why does it look like that? Why are there things sticking out? Um, is it flowing correctly? Are there supposed to be rocks? But that is actually what it is supposed to look like. It is a natural habitat. Um, there's tree trunks, there are rocks, um, there's natural grasses. Um, it's created um, such an array of um, habitat for so many different wildlife. Um, we have 18 species of birds currently. Um, we also had a stream study done and our, our water quality is um, excellent. Um, we found over 32 different species within the water of in invertebrates and reptiles. Um, so that's excellent. Um, make, excuse me, a huge difference from the before and after. Um, so that is what it looks like now, or did about a year ago. And then if you look at the bottom picture, um, this is from this past summer. Um, you can kind of see how the grasses have grown up, how the shrubs have come up, um, how there's more habitat that's been created. Um, you can see kind of the stream. That's kind of where we do our stream studies there in the back. That's the uh, largest area for habitat. Um, we found a turtle while we were down there even. And before um, in 2018, um, you couldn't even see anything, um, let alone a turtle or anything else. There wasn't even a bird that flew by. So um, this uh, project itself has been amazing to watch and see. And again, we have met all of our MS4 requirements because of that. Um, and Land Studies did a fabulous job. I can't say enough about them um, and the work that they did here. 
So phase two is what um, we are actually in now, almost completed. Um, you'll see up here in the left-hand corner is our pickleball court. And then in the right-hand corner is our basketball court, all using the uh, previous pavement that Lori had talked about. And then at the bottom, um, you'll see uh, our walking path, the extension there, and that is the second bridge. And then off in the distance there behind, um, you can see we have put in a new parking lot uh, again with the previous pavement. And there are multi-purpose fields as well. Um, we did not do any digging. They're basically natural fields. We put fencing around them and then can be used for a variety of activities from soccer to football to lacrosse. Um, so that's why they're considered multi-purpose. There's two of those that we've added. So uh, another exciting opportunity that came to us this past year um, was the Streamside uh, Forest Buffer and Meadow. Um, this was a partnership with the Alliance of the Chesapeake Bay, DCNR, and the Penn State Master Watershed Stewards. So they actually approached us when they saw that this project was happening. At, uh, they saw the first phase of the park and asked if we'd be interested in a partnership um, to build basically a forest along the creek um, that runs through the park. It would create shade, it would create additional habitat, and of course make it actually look like more of a park, not just a golf course, you know, in a big field. Um, so this is actually done at no cost to the township. Um, it's a three-year um, agreement, and the uh, Chesapeake Bay Alliance provides a master forester and the funding through DCNR, and then the master, or the Penn State Watershed Stewards come in and actually um, take care of the planting of the trees, um, the setup of the meadow, and then they help maintain that over the course of the three years. Um, all the funding is then handled through those, those grant monies for the three years, and then the public works, um, or if you had a park and rec um, maintenance department, would then be able to have some training and um, learn from the master forester how to take care of these forest buffers and meadows. So over the course of the three years, they would be training you on how to take care of that and what the cost would be, future costs would be for the township um, after those three years. So it's a great opportunity. And um, I know Brian said he's going to give you the contact information, but I highly suggest um, you contacting them if you're interested in learning more about that or looking to plant some trees. Um, this is some pictures. They came out in October and planted 275 trees. So you see the trees here. Um, those are the tunnels so that the deer don't eat all of the trees. Um, so eventually, um, you'll see over to the left is the creek. Um, eventually, you will have a um, natural forest buffer. And then we'll also have some more rows of trees creating that forest walkway. Um, at the end there in the back along that tree line, um, there are actually going to be some trees that have um, fruit. Um, and berries that we'll be able to pick and harvest. And Shalley had a great idea that maybe that could be a donation to our local food bank and have some volunteers come in and do that. So um, I think that's a great opportunity to engage our community a little bit further. And it's also helping the township become more climate resilient as Lori had talked about um, previously as well. So again, these are the master stewards. Um, this kind of gives you an overview of what it actually looks like now. Looks a little bit um, silly now and I get a lot of questions, what are all those pipes? Um, doing in your park, but they're actually trees. <laughs> um, so I hope, you know, in the next two or three years, be able to um, have another picture and show you how beautiful our forest will be. Our meadow is not in yet. Um, that's something that they'll do in the springtime. And again, they will um, teach the um, maintenance department on how to take care of that over the next three years. So maintenance and training. Um, unfortunately for me, I don't have a park and rec maintenance department. Um, none of the municipalities that I'm in um, have that um, for us but they, all the public works departments um, assist with any um, park issues, maintenance, um, or any events that we're having. Um, but I'm happy to say um, just this past month, um, because of this park and because of this project and because what we've been able to do, not only with funding leverage um, that, that hasn't been on the township, um, that they have created a position um, for a parks maintenance person, very exciting for me, um, that will help um, and with any existing or future parks um, that we have in Jackson Township and within our regional partnerships. Um, so we're hoping to take advantage of the Pennsylvania um, Park Maintenance Institute for some additional training for that new person. And again, like I'd mentioned, the, the Master Gardeners and the Chesapeake Bay Alliance, this is huge for this person because they're going to be teaching about the trees and the forest and the plants. And those are all things that are extremely important um, within our parks to keep them uh, viable. Um, and so we're really excited about that. So it's created a job and then also um, the Chesapeake Bay Alliance and the Master Gardeners is going to also assist with funding um, for environmental interpretive signage within our park. We're super excited to have, you know, some things along the bridges and along the trees, identifying what kind of trees do we have? Why do we have those? 
Um, and along the bridges, what habitats are there? What animals are living within this, uh, this stream? Um, what, have, what new animals have moved in um, since the creation of you know, this, uh, the stream being um, redone? Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Kate. That was Thank wonderful. Uh, Chalet, you're up. Hi, everybody. I'm Chalet Harris. I'm with Dover Township um, Recreation. Um, we are an older township in New York County. We've been around since 1743. We're a class two township. We cover 41 square miles and we have over 21,000 residents. That's an old number. I think that's going to go up with the new census. Um, I am a one person rec department. So I am the only full-time admin person, um, but I work very closely with the um, Public Works Department's facility superintendent, and he has a staff of three, and their response, himself and three people, and their responsibilities are overseeing all of township-related properties, and including rental properties that we use, um, and, and our parks. I do a lot of work with them. I was actually their fourth person in a crew this summer when because my stuff got canceled. So I actually went out and did a lot of work in the field with them this year. And in turn, they helped me a lot. We have five parks right now, uh, Brookside, Dover Community, Edgewood, Lair, and Mayfield that we oversee. And if you see this, 53 acres. We Our new park that we're going to talk about today is Eagle View. It's 56. So this is a huge thing for us um, because one park is doubling our size of what we can offer for our community. And this park has a lot of new features that we don't have in any of our other spaces. Um, some of the things we do, we have all different types of special events. Some of them have been going on for 50, 60 years. Our summer playground program, I met somebody who was a part of that in the 50s. They were a student in the 50s and they did that. We have fitness classes, building rentals, uh, regular classes, bus trips, all those other fun things. And that's what I get to do as well as helping plan our new parks, et cetera. So, this is um, a picture of Eagle View Park. I'm gonna kind of give you the quick tour here. So Lori, if you can help me out. We have our township building, um, kind of more centralized there. We just did a, a public works garage expansion. So that's why it looks all construction need there. Across the street, um, the other border of the park is where the high school stadium is over on the um, other way, Lori, where the football stadium is. Oh, here, is. sorry. Yeah. That's okay. That is um, the school district's property. So we have a football stadium, tennis courts, and practice fields down there that all border the stream. And that is all, um, <clears throat> pardon me, that's the high school space there. Now that middle school, it says future middle school behind that. I actually went to Dover High School. That was where I went to high school back in the 90s. And they just did a building project. Across the street is the new high school. And that big building that's in that picture was just torn down and the new high school is now up and functioning. And in between that high school and our township building is Dover Community Park, um, which is one of our smaller parks. The um, other side of the park is uh, we have some private residences. We have a big development down in that lower right corner that is building out right now called Donwood. And they have a, there's a walking access in there. It's a sewer line right of way that's also gonna be as a walking path into our park. And on the bottom there is the border is um, an older established mobile home park that's been around for oh, forever. We also were an old golf course, just like Kate. Um, the, uh, the golf course went out of business and they approached the school district and the township to see if either party was interested in buying this, the land. And it took some convincing and some time before the township saw the value um, in it. So in the summer of 2011, the township purchased the property. I saw someone pop up a question wondering how much it costs. Um, I don't know that answer. I'll have to investigate that for you. But they purchased the property then. But as times, as we all know, things change, boards change, priorities change. And so we were left with a big question mark. What do we do with this? Nobody had plans to move forward. We knew we were going to need a public works garage expansion in time. We knew we were going to need more park space, but nothing pushed it forward. Um, I wish I could tell you it's because that playground floods like that. That's why we moved forward. But it was stormwater, but not because of that playground. This kind of whole thing started with a conversation between myself and Lori because I didn't know what to do because my playground does that. It was, I've been here five and a half years. My play, playground has flooded like that, oh, about 15 to 20 times. And I wanted to try to relocate it to another spot. So that kind of started the conversation, but our board wasn't super interested in 
pursuing the moving of it at that time. This, um, the stream that runs through the, the new park also runs through this park here. So um, we knew we had to do something. Stormwater is what pushed us forward. And um, so we can, got a hold with land studies just like Kate did. Actually, you wanna, there we go. And um, York County Stormwater Consortium identified a portion of our stream for a project. When land studies was brought in, they looked at it and expanded the scope of the work to cover the full stream and tributary that run through our, our golf course. You can see that highlighted on their plan in that like blue area. This is a unique project because 100% of all of that blue space is on land that we own as a township. We do not have to deal with other residents or other municipalities or anything like that. So the township saw that as well. We can meet our MS4 requirements and we can do it just with us. So they expanded that project and did the full impact. As um, Land Studies was doing their work, we actually brought in YSM to develop the uh, recreation side of things. This was an early draft that Land Studies had put together. Um, and then we actually had some funding meetings with DEP, DCNR, Land Studies, YSM, that's the, arch the landscape architect, and our township maintenance staff, et cetera, to try to talk about where's the money. But that bottom thing I wanna let you look at there. This is the number of reductions that were estimated to be coming out of this project. So we're supposed to be removing 132,845 pounds a year of solids. The nitrogen is 222 pounds and phosphorus is 201. And if I'm under, I'm not be honest, I'm not huge, very like Lori, I'm not as um, knowledgeable on the MS4 side, but I believe that they've done some testing now that that work is done. And I think the numbers are actually higher than they initially thought. And I'm pretty sure this makes meets our requirements with just like Kate did with this project. Um, you want to go next? Well, one? still more water. Yeah, that that's um, what led you to moving forward was the stormwater. Yeah, we had this meeting all of those requirements and such. It wasn't the flooding of the playground. I wish it was that it was meeting the MS4 requirements that pushed this project forward. The, the stick. Yes, absolutely. So we had a great project. We met with all these future funders to talk about what it was we were doing here. Um, I'll be honest, we, we applied for funding anywhere we could. And these are the ones we finally got yeses on. We applied to PennDOT's um, task program and we made it into that, but we didn't get chosen. We applied for DCED's money, but we weren't chosen for that one. But Growing Greener was the match that worked. So we received almost $1.5 million from them and that was all for the stream restoration project and that was fully funding the ask. We got the full ask of what we were going for. Um, there were township, we're into it now for about a half a million, which was matches for the DEP grant. And then there were some overages in the stream portion and I'm sure that's gonna go up. Um, we had a sewer line that needed to be relocated um, that we noticed that as, the, as land studies was doing their work. And so our York County Stormwater Consortium, we were planning on asking them for funding help if there was a gap, like if say we got some money from Growing Greener, but not enough. Well, they since they funded it fully, we asked this consortium if they would help pay for that sewer line relocation since that had to happen before we could do any stream work and they agreed. So we received $605,000 from them and then DCNR gave us the 250,000 for um, towards going towards the recreation elements in phase one. So we received almost $2.4 million in funding for this project. Um, these are pictures of the stream before um, and who researched them. The township manager wrote and land studies helped to write the um, uh, ones for the uh, stream funding. I did the DCNR one and now going forward, we're doing more together. Can you go back one, Lori, please? So if you can see, we had these crazy high stream banks and, um, and such here. We have a high school program science class and a middle school science class that go into the stream to do their stream study work. And I could see this happening from my office window. And it was very unsafe to see these kids climbing down and trying to get into the water and trying to see the teachers teach with kids doing this. So part of what I wanted to do going forward was to give them a safer way to get into the water and have that educational moment. And we'll talk about what that is in a little bit. So these, go ahead, Lori. These are photos of during the restoration work. Um, that top picture on the left, it's hard to see, but there's a bird flying in there. We've seen 
all different types of species of birds coming in as the project has been worked on. We've seen killdeer, kingfishers, her green, um, uh, green herons, blue giant herons. Um, saw a least bittern, which I don't even know what that was. We saw, um, we had to look that one up. We saw on September 11th, we saw a bald eagle in Eagle View Park and right beside the high school's football stadium and the high school football team is the eagle. So they're the eagles. So that was pretty neat. Um, one of the things I wanted to showcase in these pictures, they, one of the things land studies did as part of the restoration project was they do a lot of research to find out what this would have looked like prior to um, everybody coming in and changing it with all of all the stuff that we do as humans and whatever. And they found that this would have been a meadow with little channels of water running through it. And then, so you can really see that, especially in that picture on the right, you can see the channels developing. And then there's some other ones you'll see later. They have deep pockets that are for the wildlife and um, such like that and the fish and, and things um, too. And then on the left picture is what we had before, kind of a cross section. On the right is what we have now. We have those channels kind of running through. And the way this is designed is that in a big rain event, the water comes out of those small channels, filters into that big basin that you see there, and the plants that are put in there are specifically chosen because they like um, they like the nitrogen, they like the phosphorus, and they are going to slow that water down as it moves downstream. The, um, the big work is done on our stream project, and I'm happy to say that since they've done that, we have had no flooding in that park with the, the crazy playground which is upstream from it. And the neighbors that are right beside us usually have water up to their back door. They've not flooded yet since. So it's doing its job on that. Um, this is our master plan that from the phase one, this is the early version of our phase one master plan. The components that were in there, we had the stream restoration project was huge. The sewer line relocation, which there's actually a really cool element on that I wanna to touch on in a second. We have an ADA trail that, in this picture you see it's an out and back. Well, when the sewer line had to get relocated, they need to create an access road to get to their line so they can bring their, bring their big trucks into service, the manholes. Well, they um, created a section of trail and added about a thousand feet to what we were going to have with this rough idea of the plan. So we were actually able to make a looping trail um, with the thousand feet of trail that they're going to use that serves doubles up as their right of way and they paid for it because it was something that they needed. So that was something unexpected and a pleasant surprise. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. At the top of the, kind of in the center of the picture there, you can see a pavilion. That pavilion is going to have a fireplace. It's a warming hut because going up to the right from there is actually a sledding hill. Um, that's a natural, that's an old fairway uh, in the middle there, Lori, up a little higher. Nope, not in between where you were, between the lines of trees. Yeah, in there. That's an old fairway from the golf course, and it's going to be repurposed as a sledding hill. When the school did their construction project of the new high school, they took away one of the community's great sledding hills because of um, they needed space for their um, stormwater for the new high school. So we're able to give them, give this back to the community, which is really, really neat. And I think this one might actually be better. We also are adding an 18 hole amateur level disc golf course and my favorite, the outdoor classroom to help the teachers um, you know, that were struggling with trying to teach the kids. The outdoor classroom sits at the confluence where the two streams come together. Um, and we'll give you a, show you kind of a little more about where that is in the next couple slides. So these are before and after aerials that land studies took. The top pictures are of the main stem of the stream and you can really see in that second on the right side picture those channels and those deep pockets for the fish and the wildlife. Um, another cool thing is the trees that were taken out were put, a lot of them were put back into the ground to, to give that carbon back to the soil. And then you'll see like Kate talked about those random pieces of sticks and stuff that are standing upright out of the stream. Those are for the, the birds and the wildlife and such like that. So it's really going back to what nature intended. The, sec the center pictures there of the confluence where the two streams come together and that big tree on the right side where that tree is located and that picture on the right, 
that's going to be close to where our outdoor classroom is going to be. It's going to sit outside of the floodplain there, but the, the kids will be able to get down right into the water very easily. The bottom picture is of the um, tributary before and after. The tributary has a lot of uh, wetland. So if you look at how much we mowed in that left side picture versus the footprint of the tributary in the right side picture, you can see how much drastically, how much less we have to mow because of the new spaces. And in the left picture, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a spot on the hillside there, kind of where those trees come to the right, where you see um, tracks in the grass because a mower got stuck and then a backhoe came to get it out and then the backhoe got stuck. So we were mowing actually into wetland space, but not really knowing we were doing that. So this is, um, oh, one back one. Yeah, just so you know, it's 12, it's uh, oh, 120. This is phase two. We're going to be adding bridges and a baseball field and parking lots. That's our goals for phase two and connecting trails to everything. And then for our maintenance side of things, we have a, an agreement with land studies. Um, they're going to stick around and teach us how to train, or tra how to train our staff, how to maintain the space. Um, and we are actually getting a new job out of this too. The public works uh, group that I work with is adding a fourth person. So we can have two crews, two for parks and two for facilities. So we are actually getting a new job out of that too. That person will be hired next year. We are gonna have signage going in as part of phase one as well. And then the school's even gonna create some signage for us going forward too. So. Thanks Shelley. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna give a quick summary. As you can see, uh, you know, we started out talking about the stick, which was the regulatory requirements and everything that these communities are, communities are struggling with, acerbated by climate change. And then we found out that parks can be the carrot and, and can be the place where a lot of these mandates to clean water and manage st storm water can occur and they have multiple benefits. They can enhance recreation facilities serving diverse population interests. They offer many multiple funding sources and opportunities, as you saw with the examples in the two townships, and they create climate resilient communities. So I just wanted to give a plug here. Uh, DCNR does have a green stormwater infrastructure web page that has all sorts of resources on it that you can go to. Um, so now I'm going to uh, just, Brian, BK, I don't know how you want to do this. I'll stop sharing, I guess to do question and answer. Sure, thank you. Uh, there was one question in the chat box and I believe it popped up when Kate was talking and it, it's asking, can you give us an idea of how much it costs to purchase the golf course property for your project? And was that uh, part of the township contribution or was that something outside of that? So uh, it was about $450,000. It was outside of all those numbers that you saw before. Um, so they actually uh, had planned to purchase and had been um, putting back some money in their recreation, recreation escrow fund um, for the purchase of some property. We had been looking at several. Um, so they did have a bit of a bank put to the side to purchase something for a regional park. Um, but DCNR does have land acquisition grants. So, you know, if you don't have the funding to purchase property, there is that opportunity there that um, you could look for funding just to get, you know, the land itself and then begin to develop it. But yes, it was separate from this project. Yes, we do have grants for acquisition projects. They, and if you'd like to talk to me about it, my contact information is available. Now we looked you know, at Pennsylvania very specifically, but if, if we're kind of extrapolating some of this learning for other folks in other states, you know, is there kind of some best practice approaches in a sense of kind of looking at um, you know, the, the state DEPs and looking at the state, uh, you know, not every state may have the community and economic development department, but is there kind of a, a type of organization to approach first, or would you look about, uh, you look for your land study kind of groups and your engineers first, or like, where's the chicken and the egg, if you will? I would say the first step is to do planning of any project, and the planning will enable you to uh, being, bring partners in 
and understand the needs of your community to identify those priorities of types of projects you want in your park. And then also talk to your engineers that work for your, now, you know, Pennsylvania has all these municipalities, but so your counties or wherever, whoever's in charge of ma managing your stormwater requirements, in engage them. We, you know, with Kate's project, it was a little, they came on a little bit later because we were just exploring and gaining understanding of how the two programs could work together, DEP and DCNR. So it was almost like a pilot. Whereas Chalet, we were well into it and we brought, you know, having the two firms, I would strongly suggest that you have a combination of a firm that understands natural systems and also a landscape architect, an engineer, and a recreation professional so that you combine all of those um, careers and understanding to look at a park holistically. Because when people look at a park holistically, that's when they can have the most partners. That's when they can say, okay, DEP is interested in improving water quality and you know, de-channelizing streams. DCNR is not necessarily, that's not necessarily our main focus. It's part of it. We do repairing buffer projects. We do some types of green infrastructure in our parks, but DEP is really, that's their, you know, that's their thing. And whereas DCNR is focused more on the recreation elements uh, and we can combine the two. In the case of PennVest, I don't know if your state has an agency, you probably do, that works with communities on their infrastructure. So sewer and water, that's what PennVest does. And in Pennsylvania, we have partnered with PennVest on repairing buffer projects. We've partnered with them actually in some cases to acquire land to, cre uh, to preserve that watershed, to reduce the flooding. So more and more, we're seeing that communities, if they look beyond the single focus of a park and look at the multiple jobs that a park can do and which funding agency mandate or miss which funding agencies focus of their program is that is that thing is that whatever they they're interested in their their goals and match it with what you want to do with your park and then create a funding strategy i always recommend that in a large capital project you create a five-year funding strategy and you lay out all of the funders that could fund different parts of your project when the applications are due who matches who, so on and so forth, and then have a funders meeting, have them all come together and talk about it. And the thing that was so great about these two projects is maintenance has been such a challenge with these um, types of projects because typical municipal workforce is not accustomed to or trained to managing uh, storm, naturalized stormwater projects or green infrastructure. So they need training on how to do this. There's, um, you know, PRPS Maintenance is doing that, uh, Institute is doing that. You have nonprofit organizations such as Alliance doing that. Land Studies will offer that as a service. There's other groups that can do that. Uh, so I guess that's a long answer, but planning, to summarize, planning is the key. Planning is the most important. And if I could just add to that as being the, somebody writing the grant for Lori, I think it's so important to make sure you are partnering. I can't write that grant without the engineer. You know, I can't write the grant without the township. You have to have that support and making sure you know what you're applying for and that you have a viable project and reaching out to the person, you know, like Lori for DCNR and knowing what the requirements are and what you need to have because if you try to write a grant and don't have those things in place, you'll never be successful and you'll be wasting everybody's time. So be prepared, do your research, know what you need for the type of grant that you're applying for and don't try to do it alone. Um, get the assistance and get the help and make sure you have the right people um, to write the type of grant that you're writing. I'm gonna piggyback on her, really, really know your project inside and out. Know what each element is and what the benefits are and how it could possibly be matched up with something else. For example, for us, for our match for the DCNR funding, land studies did the rough grades of the park. They did, they had all these spoils coming out of the stream. They had, uh, we had that uh, garage expansion project that we did and we had a pile of dirt left over from that. They put in some spots in those pictures, 16 feet of fill in to create the flat spaces of our park. 
And that grass that's growing there is some of the greenest grass I've ever seen because it came right out of the stream. It's nutrient rich. And so we didn't have to pay to ship that away. We put it on site to create the spaces of the park. So really, you really need to know what you got and where you can match things up because that was one of the where we can make our match with uh, the funding we got from uh, DEP. And there was a question that popped up in the, the chat box there, but my dad always said that, you know, water is something that you can't necessarily completely move. You can't control it. It's going to move anyway. So, um, you know, did you find that as you were moving the water out of your park areas, did it just move downstream to somebody else's problem or was it actually mitigated and did the, you know, did it do its job? Did it just become part of the ta water table as opposed to just pushing it on down the road? I can answer that. We, um, we have three parks all along the same waterway. The one that flooded really crazy, the one we're working on now, and another one downstream. We have not had any additional, if we have any high water over there, it's normal. We haven't seen, if anything, it's been lower. We haven't seen anything crazy flooding at that park downstream. Now, it's quite a little bit downstream. It's not like right next door. But we haven't seen, we have not heard anything from people downstream of that being a problem. I don't think we shipped it downstream. I think we took care of it in our park. Sorry, and how about the, oh, sorry, Kate, go ahead. <laughs> um, for me, same thing. We have any issue, haven't had any issues, but the, the piece of the stream in the park was done, but there's actually um, more of that stream within the township. So they actually continued on from there and have done more pieces of the stream. Um, so now it's flowing great. Um, so they started in the park and then continued on um, through the minute, through the township, um, but we don't have any issues um, since they've completed all of that work. And I see there's another question about the golf course and having unhappy residents. Yes, <laughs> um, we went through that. Um, we did have an open meeting for those residents to attend and voice their opinions, concerns, suggestions. Um, it was about a three year, before we even started the park, it was about a three year process where people could give their feedback. Um, so yes, you're always gonna have those un unhappy residents, but to be honest, overall, the park since it's been built has been amazing. And the, I think the residents were, were shocked and were so happy once they actually saw the park and the amenities uh, and that we listened to some of those you know, um, wants and needs. Um, so it's actually turned tables now that it actually has been built and they see the opportunities that we're providing and the program we can do. Um, so yes, it was, it, it was hard at first, but it does get better and they will come around. You just gotta give it some time, but just engage them. That's the biggest thing I can tell you. Let them have their voice be heard, listen, um, take their opinions into consideration because um, that'll go a long way. And I, I just wanna emphasize how important it is in your project to have signage uh, because I know of other projects in York County where they, they have green infrastructure and they have these, uh, you know, meadows and uh, the public is not used to them. They, they say that they look like weed gardens and there's not interpretive signage to help the public understand that that is an important function and that those plants have a function and a job to do. And in the city of Lancaster, I didn't feature them today because there's just not enough time. You could spend a whole presentation on them, uh, but they had, they were, the EPA told them either you clean up your sewer and water system or you're going to be fined gazillion dollars. And they looked into both, they, they both did a green infrastructure plan and they looked into the traditional gray infrastructure of building a brand new sewer plant, sewer treatment plant versus doing green infrastructure. And the cost savings were just incredible. It was almost double the amount it would take if they were to put in a brand new sewer system. So they have educational signs throughout their parks because they do look different. And it's a way, it's a great opportunity to educate people, not only about the benefits of nature, but how a park can become a necessity and not just a nice thing to say. When we're fighting for, you know, we're, we're advocating for so much little funds that are available. When you say a park has a purpose, a park has multiple, fun has multiple functions beyond a soccer team, it really brings value to the community because you can say that this park is solving a problem. It's helping get rid of the stick. So um, I, 
I appreciate the opportunity to talk. We're at, uh, you know, over one thirty. Brian is, do you want to wrap this up? And I'm, you know, I'm conscientious of people's time. And if anybody wants the context, please let us know. That's a great closing segue. We want to respect everyone's time. I imagine if you had a one thirty, you've already dropped out, but, um, I have gathered the information of all the contacts uh, that our presenters have put together, as well as uh, I, I can take any of the requests out of the chat box there and gather some of that information. Lori, we'll, we'll ask you uh, to share your slides sure, if absolutely. you're willing, and we can put we can put all those things together, and I can share those. Uh, at the end of our session here, once everything is processed. This was recorded, so I will share that recording. We keep it on our YouTube channel with all of our other previous Shop Talk events, uh, multiple topics we've gone through. And that way, uh, keep learning with us. And please reach out to me, uh, bk at prps.org, and let me know what you need to know, because it helps us to help you uh, in support of all of our communities out there. We're trying to um, re-envision what maintenance is and think of it as a proactive approach as opposed to a reactive approach at all times. So thank you, Kate. Thank you, Chalet. Thank you, Lori, for your time and your dedication to our communities and our industry and our, you know, our environment as well. And uh, thank you everyone for participating today. Uh, we hope to host you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good luck with your projects.